You know, I also, this made me think of something. Um, I never dreamed or imagined that I would be running a tech company. That was not part of my dream, right? My dream was to like go abroad, get a PhD, come back home in Egypt and become a faculty member, right? And I just needed to optimize for that first step, which is like, okay, go abroad and get a PhD. But what I didn't expect or anticipate is that I I grew my dream. My dream evolved. I had a new dream now, which is I wanted to become a researcher and, and that soon thereafter, I wanted to become an entrepreneur. And that's okay. So I, I often tell people, don't think 10 steps ahead. Take that first step and then see where that leads you. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Rana, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it is my pleasure to have you here. I actually found out about your book, Girl Decoded, by way of your publicist. And uh, as I mentioned to you in your email, it was one of those books where I just tore through it. I had so many underlined and highlighted passages, and I just couldn't help but nod and smile uh, you know, with all the similarities. So I want to start by asking you what I think is a very relevant question, given how you start the book. And that is, where in the world did you grow up? And what impacted where you grew up end up having on the choices that you've made throughout your life and your career? Um, so I grew up in the Middle East. I'm originally from Egypt, um, uh, but my parents kind of moved around. So, you know, they worked in Kuwait until the first Gulf War, and then we moved to Abu Dhabi, and then I moved back to Egypt, um, and, and then I ended up doing my PhD at Cambridge University, and from then on, I, I came to MIT as a postdoc and 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 just stayed, right? Um, yeah. but, I, but I would say, like, growing up in the Middle East, there was this kind of... Um, tension between my parents being very open-minded and supporting my education. I, I also have two younger sisters and they were very pro-education, very pro, like you can do it, like you go girl, right? But at the same time, being quite conservative and, and um, you, you know, boxing us into these um, explicit gender roles. So I grew up with this tension and uh, it's been quite interesting reconciling this tension once again as a as a CEO of a tech company in a very kind of male dominated uh, tech tech community so yeah yeah I mean I think that that was one of the things that struck me was that you had this sort of um, contrast at work of you know these parents like go 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 and clearly just from having looked at your bio you've done some pretty amazing things in the world and yet you're also stuck in this sort of male dominated patriarchy what there are two questions that came for that from me. Um, what do you think that people have as misperceptions about women in the Middle East and Muslim women in general? And then what role do you think the media creates in shaping our perception of the Middle East? Because I, I feel like American media literally just paints it as this like hotbed for nothing but terrorism. Totally. And you know what? Um, my daughter, who is 17, has become obsessed with this exact question. And I think it comes from, you know, in our family, we are surrounded by really awesome Muslim women who are, you know, they don't fit into this one narrative that the media often represents of Muslim women, that we're submissive, that we're um, kind of, you know, uh, we don't have a voice uh, or that we're terrorists, right? Um, and you don't see the examples of women leaders, uh, whether it be it in business or politics or, or, or kind of socioeconomic development, like Muslim women are really kick-ass. <laughs> There's a lot of like really amazing women out there doing a, a lot of really cool stuff, but you don't see those stories. And mm -hmm. I think it's so important that we start telling these stories because, um, first of all, you need role models for other young women and young Muslim women to follow, um, but also to change that perception in, in, in non-Muslim people's minds, right? Yeah. So, yeah. How do you navigate the dynamic of sort of, you know, having your voice stifled based on, on sort of the, um, you know, males around you and yet you know that you have a voice? Because I remember you, you distinctly saying sort of the expectation, which I, I think in a lot of ways is similar to Indian culture of, you know, uh, a woman is supposed to stay home and, and cook and clean and, you know, sort of the old, very sort of, you know, ancient way of looking at yeah. women's roles in society, but that seems like it's still very prevalent. I mean, you know, just based on kind of what you had told me, I kind of guess we grew up around the similar time. And that mm -hmm. seems like mm -hmm. a fairly outdated 
you know, view, and yet it seems still prevalent. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, again, one, once again, even even with my publisher, right, uh, Penguin Random House, which is you know top top tier publisher, I felt that they really wanted to reduce the narrative to this like, oh yeah, you grew up in this like conservative like traditional. Egyptian household, and then you broke free from that and you became this liberated American woman. I'm like, ah, it's not exactly like that. Because for instance, my ma- my, mo- my mom worked her entire career and she was actually probably one of the very first p- computer programmers in the Middle East. She took COBOL programming in the 70s. That's how she met my dad. And she, you know, continued to be in the tech industry all throughout her career. So that's pretty unusual. And that's a story that people don't know, you know, they don't know that that kind of narrative exists. So for me, it's just become really important that we, we highlight that there are different flavors of a Muslim family or a Middle Eastern family um, or an Indian family, right? That, 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 that doesn't necessarily fit this one narrative. Um, So one thing I I wonder, you know, you mentioned you have siblings and this is something I'm always curious about is where you were in the birth order and how your parents uh, way of socializing siblings changes. Cause I feel like my sister got away with murder uh, <laughs> compared to what I got away with in high school. It was just like anything I asked for, it was like, God, this is going to be such an issue. And she would go out and do the exact same things. I distinctly remember one incident where she had my dad, and I think she was a freshman in high school and she had him drop her off at a house two down, you know, two houses down from where she was going. Mm-hmm. And then I remember her sending me an email or text message saying, yeah, mom and dad still think I go to cake and ice cream parties, but I'm going to parties where people are just getting shit faced. Oh, <laughs> so I take it you're the, el- you're the, yeah, I'm the oldest. You know, yeah. Yeah. Yes. I I'm, and, and you just have one younger sister. Yeah. Yeah. I I'm, I'm the oldest too. I have two younger sisters and you are, this totally resonates with me because I was like the no nonsense girl. I had like very strict curfews. Even as even when I was engaged to my fiance, my curfew was earlier than my youngest sister's curfew, where she would be. You know, she was in high school and I was I was engaged. We're eight years apart, um, and I would have to come back home before she had to come back home. And I was like, what kind of fair world is this? <laughs> I'm fair world. <laughs> so uh, I absolutely hear you on that one. Yeah. What um, what are social dynamics and social relationships like, um, particularly for women at that age, you know, when you're in high school and you're growing up mm. uh, in a place like Egypt and the Middle East? Like, I, I don't imagine it, it resembles high school here in the United States. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I we, we, our, our core values as a family are very much like you work super hard. So work ethic and, and kind of doing your best is is, is really key academic excellence, of course, right? So so we grew up in this house where learning is, you know, lifelong learning is a core value. Working hard is a core value. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I was not allowed to date until I graduated college. So, wow. so yes. So my first, my first date was basically the guy I ended up marrying and I was 19 when I met him. Uh, <laughs> which is interesting because my daughter is a rising senior in high school. And we mm-hmm. have this continuous debates on whether, uh, like, she should be allowed to date or not. And I'm like, <laughs> the only date you can have is the one you eat, my friend. So that uh, is hilarious. Yeah. So, so I still have a little bit of Egyptian uh, in me. I guess. Well, it's, it's funny because Indian parents, I think, are, you know, they spend the first 20 years of your life saying, oh, don't talk to girls, don't talk to girls. Hassan Minaj had a really hilarious sketch about this. And he said, <laughs> then right after that, like, why don't you have a girlfriend? <laughs> like, exactly. Wait a minute, you salted my game for 25 years. I'm like, come on. <laughs> you know what my daughter, uh, my, my, what my daughter said, which is actually pretty persuasive. She said, mom, when you met dad, you had only a data point of one. Don't you want me to have like n data points so that I could make a kind of an optimal decision? I was like, okay, that's like pretty convincing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, which makes me wonder what your own parents taught you about relationships, because I think that there was one line in particular that struck me in the beginning of the book. You said that Egyptians are one of the most expressive, emotive people in the world. And yet you also said that you you know, were reluctant to speak up about things that were emotions, because I, I think this is one thing I've learned even with Indian parents is that they don't they're not physically uh 
affect, affectionate. And I remember the first time I saw my parents kiss and it was probably literally like three or four years ago. I was like, oh, that's disgusting. I wish I could unsee that because it was just so not a part of how we grew up. So, you know, I, I wonder, because I know you also said that you didn't have like models for what a relationship should be like other than what your parents and you said you didn't want that. True. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it is interesting that, again, Egyptians, probably like Indians, are very expressive, right? But there's so much taboo when it comes to relationships. Like, you don't talk about sex. You don't mm-hmm. talk about intimacy. You don't see intimacy around you. I mean, my parents, yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't know if I've ever seen my parents kiss. Um, yeah. But they love each other, right? Um, I mean, they've been together for, for many, many years. Um, and, and so I... And, and actually, I talk about this in the book. Uh, when I first moved to the U.S., uh, my mentor and role model, Professor Rosalind Picard, who I ended up starting Affectiva with, um, she invited me to to her dinner, to dinner at her place. And, and we had dinner, cleaning up, and then her husband, Len, insisted on... Um, loading the dishwasher, like cleaning the dishes. And loading the dishes. <laughs> I remember that. And I was horrified. I was like, no, 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 I'll do it. I'll do it. And he was like, no, that's my job. And I was like, what? <laughs> it was the first time I had seen a guy help in the kitchen. And it just mm. like, it was just, it really, really surprised me. And, and, and so I, 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 I guess when I said I wanted a different type of relationship, yeah. I, I wanted one that is really built on equality um, and, and I, I didn't see that around me. So I, I have to ask, because there's one thing that really struck me in the courtship process that you mentioned, um, one, what is the courtship process like? And I have to have you tell the story about the private investigator. Cause I was like, are you oh. kidding me? <laughs> oh yes. Okay. So, um, so I, I met well, who's now my ex, uh, when I was 19 and he just had a startup. We met actually, I, I was interviewing at his startup, uh, didn't get the job, but met him and, and, and he became very interested in pursuing me, whatever. Um, so then, um, after a year of kind of dating without my mom knew my sisters knew, but we couldn't tell my dad cause we knew the minute we would tell him he would want well to propose. And sure enough, <laughs> you know, we tell my dad and, um, and, and he's like, okay, we need to meet the family. And so we put this on the calendar, his family, his parents and his brother and, and, and well are supposed to come meet us. Um, but unbeknownst to me, my dad um, engages with a private investigator to really get the scoop <laughs> on the family. And uh, right in the middle, you know, so we host them and it's pretty tense. Like you could tell that my dad's not really bought in. And in the middle of, of, of this, uh, y- you know, of this dinner thing, uh, my dad gets a call and it's literally that private investigator basically giving him the green light. And, and then the conversation was just awesome. And, and you could tell like there was a shift in the mood. Um, uh-huh. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was interesting. I don't know. Did, did your ex ever know about, did they know about the, the private investigator? Yeah, I think, I think it came out. It's, 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 it's kind of standard practice actually. Like, cause you want to know, <laughs> it's so interesting. It's not just about, you know, well, was super well educated and he grew up yeah. internationally as well. And, you know, went to the same schools I did. And, um, but, but my dad was very interested in the history of the family. Like that's a very important criteria. Um, yeah. and so he, yeah. Well, it, it's funny you say that because I, I, I remember one of my cousins who I'm, I'm extremely close to, who was like my other sister. I remember mm-hmm. talking to her husband about the, the sort of arranged marriage process. Mm-hmm. And the question I had for him is, why does that actually work? And mm-hmm. one of the things that he said to me is he said, the thing is that you have dozens of people. He said, yes, it's kind of annoying and awkward, but he said there are a lot of people invested in the outcome to make sure that it all works out. So they, they're actually looking out for your best interest. And I was like, yeah, but that still sounds incredibly invasive. Uh, but that really struck me. I thought, oh, wow, okay, well, maybe there is a reason that this works. It isn't, I mean, this wasn't arranged because I met him again, yeah. I was reviewing at his company, but, um, you know, fast forward 12 or 13 years when we were getting a divorce. And, um, and again, I talk about this in the book very openly, both our parents were super involved in the whole process. Like in the U.S., I would imagine if you want to get a divorce, you just agree as a couple and then you tell everybody else and it's, you know, and then you just execute the plan. For us, it was this like (laughs) person, eight person, the uncles, like my my in-laws were involved, my uncles and aunts were involved. And it was just like this gigantic production on, on, um, 
you know, of course, why we shouldn't get divorced and how we could fix it all. And I should just start cooking and it will all be fine. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, it, 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 when I started talking about the divorce, my, how my divorce unfolded here in the United States, people were just shocked at how involved and, and how much weight was given to our parents' voice in the whole process. So parents are very involved. Even if it's not an arranged marriage, my point is, even yeah. if it's not an arranged marriage, the parents have a very, very big voice in how this mm-hmm. all shakes out. Yeah. Well, I mean, speaking of the voice of the parents, uh, you know, I know that you went to Cambridge and I remember that very distinctly. So what I wonder about that is, you know, you have this moment in which you know that by going down that path, you're going to make a very transformative decision, one that can change your life, one that you have this deep desire to pursue. And there's so many people who I think arrive in moments like that, sort of the inflection points in any hero's journey, and they actually don't actually do it. Why do you think that is? Like what prevent as somebody who did it despite you know, having so many odds against you or, or so many obstacles in your way, why do you think people who don't have anywhere near the challenges that you did uh, choose not to do anything in moments like that? Oh, it's interesting how you ask it. Um, I think it's courage. I mean, well, let me think about this because you're right. Like I had so many people around me basically say, I really shouldn't, you know, leave to go do my PhD. Um, so there were like the majority of the voices around me were basically naysayers. Um, I guess for me, it was, it was, it was a passion, right? It's like this like deep conviction that I can build this technology and it can be really transformative and I want to play a part in it. Right. I think that was the drive. Like there was this internal drive that I couldn't, um, I couldn't quite, qu- qu- quiet and down. I don't know. It's interesting. So I, I think, I think people, who don't make these um, leaps, right? Um, I, yeah, I think it's a matter of courage. I don't know. What do you think? I'm curious. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that as somebody who has chosen to spend my life in a creative career with a sister who is literally, by all accounts, every Indian parent's dream come true because she's a uh-huh. doctor. And not only is she a doctor, she's a badass doctor. Cool. Uh, you know, and that's what one of my friends, best friend says from college. He's like, your sister is every Indian parent's dream come true. And he's like, and I'm like, I'm like every Indian parent's nightmare come true. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think there, there are a lot of reasons. You know, it, this is a conversation I've been having with a lot of people lately when I've been talking to them. So as a, a society, as a culture, you know, we are really relentless about this sort of promotion of you can do anything you want, you can be anything you want. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I think it's to our detriment because I think people make decisions based on instinct rather than data. And they find themselves in situations they can't get out of where it's like, Oh, leap. Like I, I found it, you know, one of the strangest things that Reed Hoffman ever said. And he said, you know, it's like you leap out of uh, building a startup, which there's a grain of truth to this, is, is like jumping out of an airplane without a parachute. Mm-hmm. And on the flip side of that, I remember uh, David Heinemar Hansen from, uh, you know, uh, now base camp said, yeah. you know, you make terrible decisions on an empty stomach. And yet you, it, it's funny because both stories wow. work out, but there are probably a lot of stories of people who make those leaps and basically fall to their death, yeah. metaphorically speaking. Um, so I, I think that, 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 you know, we do have to take practical considerations yeah. into consideration because I think there's a combination, like you have two ways you could do this. One is irrational optimism, which is mm-hmm. in a lot of ways, what I think the self-development world is guilty of perpetuating myself included, even, you know, by producing this podcast. And then there's rational optimism, which I think is intelligent decision-making that leads to outcomes that are actually good. So that that's kind of my take on it. You know, I also, this made me think of something. Um, um, often people, ask, I never dreamed or imagined that I would be running a tech company. That was not part of my dream, right? My dream was to like go abroad, get a PhD, come back home, in Egypt and become a faculty member, right? And at some point, and I just needed to optimize for that first step, which is like, okay, go abroad and get a PhD. But 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 what I didn't expect or anticipate is that I I outgrew my dream. I had I then my dream evolved. I had a new dream now, which is I wanted to become a researcher and and that soon thereafter I wanted to become an entrepreneur. And that's okay. So I, I often tell people don't think 10 steps ahead. Just maybe optimize, take that first step and, yeah. and, and then see where that leads you. Yeah. Well, speaking of that first step, um, 
let's talk um, specifically. The, there are two things I wonder about. Um, one is is adapting to different cultures when you come from another one. Like, what aspects of culture shock did you experience, both um, being in Cambridge as well as coming to the United States? Uh, culture shock. Um, I think the biggest culture shock. So, I, I, I my, my foray into the United States was basically I landed at the MIT Media Lab, which is this hot pot of like super creative, interdisciplinary, rebellious, um, y- you know, researchers and innovators, right? And I was at the time commuting back and forth between Cambridge, um, Massachusetts and, and Cairo, Egypt. So I would, you know, spend a couple of weeks in the US and then go back home and spend a couple of weeks in, in Cairo and so on. I did that for a number of years. Um, and the, the contrast in terms of appetite for taking risk was insane. Like in Egypt, you, you get penalized for taking risks and there's a lot of naysayers and people just look at you as like you're nuts, right? In at the media lab at MIT, it's the only way to be. You had to be a risk taker. And, and there was so much um, appreciation for failure. In fact, we never thought of it as failure. If you if you if you prototyped an idea and it didn't work, you iterate on it and or you or you dump it and move on to the next idea. It's fine. Uh, whereas in Egypt it, w- it it was it was a very different um, lens on innovation. There was a lot of fear of failure. And I think that to me was the biggest, um, yeah, the, the, yeah, that was definitely the biggest difference. And Mm. I just loved the creative design thinking approach that MIT took to like solving world problems. I just like really, it just like really kind of cultivated this energy within me. And, um, and I try to bring that back home, actually, too. So, yeah. yeah. So before we get into the actual work that you do, I, w- I want to have like one last question for you around this. You know, one thing you said was that getting a divorce, founding and running a precarious startup, living in the United States with my two children, this was not exactly the life my parents had pictured for me. And what I wonder is how your own experience of how your career has turned out, how your life has turned out, has influenced you as a mother and a parent. Ah, uh, um... So I have two kids. My daughter is 17, Jenna, and Adam is 11. And I'm a single parent. I'm divorced. And it's just the three of us here in the U.S. Everybody else is um, back in in Egypt. Um, For me, they're very much part of of what I do. So I bring them into what I do at Affectiva. We often have long debates on my leadership style, key decisions I have to make, um, you know, key markets that we have to enter. I just talk to them as if they were my like investor or board member. And I feel that that has instilled this, it's, it's empowering, right? I, I, I feel that they, um, again, they've inherited, if you like, some of the core values that my parents instilled in me, which is lifelong learning um, and, and, and an amazing work ethic, but also wanting to be this global citizen of the world and and a bridge back to the Middle East. Like I tell them all the time, we are so privileged to be here and and do the type of work that I do and you guys be in the schools that you're in. And it's 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 a privilege, but with privilege comes responsibility. So I, I feel very adamant that I have a role to, to pay it forward and and actually that they also have a role to pay it forward, even, even as, you know, even, even as young as they are. And I, I think that kind of, that permeates in, in, in a lot of what they do at school and how they, you know, they're, I, I tell them a lot of people here in Milton, Massachusetts, where we live have never been to Egypt or the Middle East, and they've never interacted with an Egyptian. And so in a way we're ambassadors to that part of the world. And when we travel back to Egypt, we're amb- we're ambassadors to the U.S. Um, so that kind of ambassador role is important in our family. Hmm. Well, let's actually get into the content of the book. Uh, you know, one of the things that you say at the very beginning of the book, which it, you know makes me wonder, like, what prompted your interest in this work? And I don't necessarily think this was true when you started this work, but you said we as a society are increasingly dangerous. We're at the risk of undermining the very traits that make us human, and. I think that that was such a a keen observation, particularly in the wake of what we're dealing with right now, Mm -hmm. where we're literally being forced to communicate with everybody in our lives in a digital format. Yeah, exactly. Like if you think about how people naturally communicate, only 10% of our 
uh, signal is in the actual choice of words we use. 90% is nonverbal, and it's kind of spit equally between your facial expressions, um, your gestures, and your vocal intonations. But when you think about our digital communication, because of just because of the way technology is designed today, it is primarily text-based, or it's primarily kind of based on the words you're saying. And often we miss out on this 90% of nonverbal communication. Um, so I'm really on a mission to capture that 90% because I believe it will, A, transform human-machine interactions, right? The way we interact with our cars and our Alexas and, it's, and our phones. But in my opinion, more importantly, it will translate into improved human-to-human -human communication, which we are we, like we're such a, in a such dire need for for better, like more empathetic communication. I, I really feel that because of the way our social media platforms are designed, we just dehumanize one another. You just send a tweet out, mm -hmm. kind of into the ether, and you, and you've no idea how it lands on your recipient. Um, yeah. which you wouldn't do if you were in the same room. Well, it's funny because I think about that when people send me pissed off emails about really strange things and I'm just like, all right, look, it, it, they don't ever consider the fact that, wait a minute, there's a human on the other end of this, right. this screen that I'm interacting with. But, um, you mentioned sort of, you know, text, face and voice. So what I'm curious about, cause I know that you've spent, you know, your career kind of figuring out how do we get emotional intelligence into technology? And like you said, human to human communication, um, how do we get that? Like, what what has been the process for your research? Uh, you know, looking at you know, I know you talked about facial expressions because, I, like, I realize that text message communication is one of those things that tends to be like this source of absolute anxiety for me when <laughs> because I can't gauge anything. It's just like, oh shit, did I just say something that made that person not want to text back? Um, you know, and it's like, okay, hey, emoticon, smiley face, okay, and then you know, if you don't hear back for a day, you're like, ah, shit, I did something wrong. Uh, like how basically how are we going to get out of this mess i guess is really where i'm going with this <laughs> yeah and I, and I have a big smile on my face that you, you can't see right now but yeah exactly like um text-based communications whether it's like personal texting or or even like i i think of of the amount of miscommunication that happens um in in my company on Slack, right? And and we now have this like whole Slack etiquette thing, just so that you're mindful in how you with how you communicate to other people around you, um, because you're missing out on all these nonverbal signals and the nuances, right? Like you can't really tell sarcasm on text unless you, you know, concatenate like ten emojis at the end of your <laughs> sentence just to make sure that it. Hey, I'm I'm kidding here, right? Yeah. And so. These, these nuanced communications, which is what makes humans, right? Like, which is, I think, at the core of what makes us humans and what makes all of our kind of face-to-face -face communications really special. Um, I, I think we're missing out on all of that. For me, like one example I like to give, so my book launched um, April 21st. So right in the middle of this, well, hopefully it's the middle of the pandemic. We don't really know the end date here, <laughs> but it was like <laughs> we were right in the middle of it, right? Everybody was at home basically. And so I had to pivot from doing an actual book tour where I was scheduled to travel nonstop for a couple of months to doing all of this virtually. And the virtual book tour or virtual book event basically looks like you know, I'm, 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 I'm in a conversation like this one and there's probably hundreds of people tuned in, but I never get to see that audience, which is very, you know, when you do it in person, you can riff off of the energy in the room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But when you do it remotely like that, I just find it very unsettling because I have no idea how these people, are they engaged? Are they rolling their eyes? Are they like bored to death? Are they skeptical? Are they fascinated? Are they inspired? I can't tell. And I wish technology like like the one I'm building was integrated into these platforms to capture all of that data. Like I don't want to, you know, I don't want to know every person's emotion, but I want to aggregate yeah. that to get a sense of uh, the engagement. Well, so it's it's funny because I remember you writing about sort of face, you know, voice intonation, and I, like one of the things I'd always wondered, just because we get some really bizarre iTunes reviews, people telling us like they've kicked drug addictions because of this podcast, like you know, all sorts of things. Yeah. And I I remember thinking right when I got to that, I was like, wow, I wonder if I could use this to measure the impact, like the emotional impact of what one of our podcasts has on our listeners, and do a study to see if I could prove with science that listening to this show makes people happier. I love that. We should do that. <laughs> I, I actually, I honestly think there is. Well, I, 
I, the reason I mentioned it because I was literally when I saw that that was the first thought that came to mind. I was like, that's what I'm going to ask her about. But um, you know, the thing that is interesting, you brought up text, and I remember writing uh, a post years ago, uh, and it ended up turning into a book called A Small Army Strategy, and it was about levels of digital intimacy. Where I said, you know, uh, and I'd learned this, you know, basically from uh, Chris Gilbo's like a really popular blog, and he said that he emailed the first thousand subscribers of his blog personally as opposed to an autoresponder. Mm-hmm. And I remember I took that to another level where I said, okay, you know what? Why just email them if you really care? Um, have a video chat with them. It was kind of like voice was, it was kind of like text was the least intimate thing you could do. Voice yeah. was the next one, video the next. And of course, meeting in person, trumping them all. Mm-hmm. And and I realized it was like the the people that I have met in person, um, whether they're you know listeners who have become friends of mine or guests who've become mentors, those are the people that I had the most transformative relationships with. So what I wonder is, is how do you build the deep learning modules to get this kind of data? Like, so for example, like I said, if we were to take Unmistakable Creative and get 150 of our listeners and say, okay, we want to understand um, what is the emotional impact of listening to one of our episodes uh, on one of our listeners. The, how does the what does the model for that look like using the technology you've built? Yeah, you, it would basically be we would have to find a way where you know as they're listening, we would be able to capture their facial expressions, right? As as they're engaging with with this content. So we do a lot of this in in the advertising in the video content world. Like we 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 what we we as in the algorithm watches people as they engage with online ads or movie trailers or Netflix shows, and we're able to capture their moment by moment emotional response. And then we're able to aggregate that across everybody and and say, oh, this was a this was a really interesting moment. Everybody perked up here or people really laughed here. People seemed skeptical when they were listening to this particular part. Um, And it's you can't get that by asking people because because we don't have that level of introspection, right? Often it's an emotional journey, right? It, there's ups mm-hmm. and downs throughout this, you know, throughout listening or engaging in an experience. Um, so anyways, we would have people listen to it while we watch their facial expressions. And, and I am sure we don't have the benchmark. We have now, I mean, we have over 50,000 video ads that we've looked at. So now we have a benchmark to tell you, okay, this shampoo ad is in the bottom 10% of all ads, but like this chocolate ad is in the top 90th percentile because it's really engaging. And we don't have that data set for podcasts, yeah. but it would be so interesting. And I think it would be, I'm now like, this is now my innovation hat on. I just keep thinking like, what does the face of inspiration look like when you inspire people with your podcast? What does that response look like? And I don't think anybody's, or or when you watch a TED talk and you leave that TED talk feeling very inspired or motivated, what does that facial expression look like? And that signature has not been studied. Thanks to the help of Rana's company, Effectiva, we're actually going to be collaborating with her on the research study that she mentioned to understand the emotional impact of listening to one of our podcast episodes. And if you're interested in volunteering to be a part of it, we would love to hear from you. Just go to unmistakablecreative.com slash emotion and fill out the form. Again, that's unmistakablecreative.com slash emotion. Well, so, you know, it's funny when you're talking about facial expressions, I like the, I have two thoughts that come to mind. One, wow, that sounds cool as shit. And then the other thought that comes to mind is, wow, people might feel violated because we're watching them. Mm -hmm. Uh, How do you, how do you deal with that aspect of this? Because I think, you know, after seeing Edward Snowden's recent interview on Vice News and and reading his book, there's this constant sense of, oh, is everybody spying on us? And so where, I mean, I know you write about ethics and I do want to talk about that in more detail, but is it even possible to do this without facial expressions yet? Or is that the only way? Cause w- like, what can you tell from, you know, I mean, obviously we could tell from people listening to, from our voices, I'm assuming like what the emotion is. Yeah, you could. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you could, you could get at that through, through vo- vocal intonations, but I'm assuming if people are listening to a podcast, they wouldn't yeah. be speaking much. Right. Um, right. Back to this concept. Cause I I'm with you. Like this is very, very personal data. And so privacy becomes paramount, but it's not just privacy. It's, it's consenting and making and consenting with transparency. So often when we consent, it's like a long five page thing. Nobody reads it. You agree to it. You really have no clue who's using that data and for what purpose. And I feel like as tech leaders and innovators, it's time for a different type of consent where it is based on just like plain English. We're going to turn the camera on. This is how we're going to use the data. We're trying to understand your emotional engagement. And 
you know, no human's going to see this data. It's going to be processed by an algorithm, um, something like that, right? Like where it's very clear. And I'm also a huge advocate that there has to be some value in return for exchanging this data. It could be monetary value. So often in market research, you get paid to turn a camera on, right? And so you can mm -hmm. evaluate whether it's worth it for you or not. Um, but there are other ways, um, you know, in the automotive industry where we do a lot of work as well, um, the value proposition is, okay, we're going to put a, an optical sensor in the vehicle. It's not recording any data. Like it's just doing the analysis on the fly and then it's deleting everything. Nothing goes to the cloud. It's all in the vehicle. Um, but the value proposition is it's, 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 it's the eyes and ear, ears for you, right? It's keeping you safe. So again, there's a trade-off mm -hmm. here, but I feel like the consumers should yeah. be empowered to make that trade-off. Yeah. Well, let's look at this through the lens of a couple of practical uh, examples that I think are more relevant to the lives of our listeners. I think the other part that interested in me was, you know, you wrote about autism as well as looking at this through the mental health. Like, what are the implications of this, this technology for our mental health? Yeah, that's something I'm very passionate about, even though it's not a main focus of my company at the moment. Um, the example I like to give, you know, when you go to a doctor, a doctor's office, they don't ask you what is your temperature or blood pressure. They just measure it. Like we have, you know, sensors for that. But in mental health, the gold standard is still on a survey from one to 10, how depressed are you or how stressed are you or how suicidal are you? And that's very subjective and it's, it's actually really unreliable. So but at the same time, we know that there are facial and vocal biomarkers for stress and depression. Um, I, I often joke that, you know, my mom lives in Egypt and I literally call her up and I'll just say hello. And just from the hello, she'll be like, what's wrong? Like, what's ha like, what happened? <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm sure you can resonate with that. And it's just, right? Yeah. She's doing it based on vocal intonation. So we know that these nonverbal signals can be quite telling we just, and we have the technology, we just need to productize it and, and scale it. So I think there's huge opportunity in mental health. And one of the kind of potential outcomes of, of this pandemic is that it's accelerated the adoption of telehealth and telemedicine. Um, and I think there's just a lot of potential to, yeah, to quantify mental health, which would allow us to intervene sooner, but also personalize the interventions. Yeah. The other part that struck me was the online dating example where you mentioned that we could potentially use the algorithms based on people's facial expressions to actually increase the quality of a match. Because like, I mean, I will tell you any guy who uses an online dating app, whether they admit it or not, I think the default is just the biological response of, oh, would I sleep with this person? Then I'll swipe yeah. right. Like that's the first instinct I think of any guy. And anybody who says that's not true is full of shit as far as I'm concerned, at least males. Okay. Uh, but the thing is that obviously that's not an effective strategy to find a life partner either. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, how does that work in, in terms, how does, how do you embed something like this in, in a situation like that? And then, you know, back to, to sort of the voice idea, could I potentially use this to tell whether my rapport with a guest was like, I could tell, you know, whether the interview was flowing well or not. And then the guest was feeling comfortable with me. Yeah, I think there's, okay, I'll, I'll answer the second question first, because it's a little yeah. easier, um, and then segue into the dating world. Um, <clears throat> you can absolutely quantify, you know, a lot of the work we do at Affectiva is just based on, on kind of tracking or understanding the emotional engagement of one person, but you, you can then e extrapolate that to, to interperson dynamics, right? And you can look at the level of rapport, level of trust, level of empathy. Um, but you can imagine both are kind of tracks, like if we're mirroring each other or we're kind of piggybacking on each other's emotions, like that's a really positive sign. But if we're like out of sync in terms of our nonverbal signals, then eh, there's definitely not a click, right? And I think yeah. that translates to, to the dating world as well. <clears throat> I often say like it's our technology, like the killer app, one killer app for it is probably a dating app that incorporates these kinds of nonverbals. Um, so I don't know, you can imagine if instead of, right. I don't know, I'm making this up in real life. So imagine if instead of just seeing like pictures of, 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 of potential matches, you see you're responding to short video clips of, you know, maybe you're kind of talking about something you're passionate about or like a hobby or I don't know. 
And, and, yeah. then, and then we're, and then you're capturing people's responses to that. And if I perk up and I look like really engaged and interested, it's probably going to translate to like real world chemistry. Whereas right now it's, I don't think the process of, of the, you know, um, these online dating apps, I don't, I, I think the, 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 the algorithm that then kind of pre- dicts whether you do well if you meet in person i don't think that that's that's a very high convergence rate so yeah. whoever kind of cracks that that that's i i'd pay for that <laughs> well do you know the, the other thing I, that made me wonder when you talked about meeting in person are we going to be at a point ever where like i could have the equivalent of a google glass and i could read this person's emotions and 10 minutes in the date i could be like to hell with this i'm out of here you clearly don't like me <laughs> um I, maybe I I don't know. Um, I mean, definitely. I mean, Google Glass has been out there for for a few years, but uh, but yeah. I think the the actual current rendition of Google Glass is pretty intrusive. Um, mm-hmm. I can imagine. I mean, for me, actually, like a lot of the work I'm doing is about improving technologies EQ, but but ultimately in, improving people's EQ. And again, the example I like to give. I don't, I've stopped memorizing anybody's phone numbers. Everything's on my phone. So in a way, the phone is a memory augmentation to my own memory. Mm-hmm. Um, I would imagine a lot of the work I'm doing around emotional intelligence could be packaged into a device that could be an EQ augmentator, right? It could say, hey, by the way, like this person's really not interested or they're really like bored. You should switch it up a little bit or <laughs> it, could, it could give you a real-time coaching or, or you look really... Like you don't look, you know, as a manager, you don't look yeah. empathetic at all. You need to look a little bit more empathetic right now. So, uh, yeah. Well, speaking of empathy, you know, I mean, I think, I, I don't remember if it was your book that had the story of the the girl who died that somebody posted on social media, like yeah. the teenagers and nobody gave a shit yeah. um, and they weren't convicted of anything. What are your, you know, I, I mean, obviously you're optimistic about what's possible with this. What scares you about what you've created? Um, the, like any technology, there's a lot of potential for good, but also potential for abuse. Uh, this technology, because emotions drive a lot of our decision making, I'm concerned that in the wrong hands, it could be used to manipulate people's decisions. It could be used um, to discriminate against people. So you could imagine in a certain um, uh, you know, undemocratic government, if if mm-hmm. you if you uh, if you express dissent through your face, so you're watching a political candidate and you express dissent in the wrong government, this could you know it could be used to discriminate against you. It could be used to, to profile people. So I, I I and 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 again used for lie detection. We've been asked to apply the technology for deception detection, and we just turn all of this business away. Millions and millions of dollars um, uh. potential revenue, and I just does not. It, it's not in line with why we started the company. So we're not mm. going to, yeah, we're not going to do that. Well, you know, I think that what, when you said, you know, you could manipulate people's decisions and I, I couldn't help but think about the whole process of copywriting and the fact that to some degree persuasion and manipulation, there's a sort of fine line, right? So how with a technology like this, do you determine where that, you know, middle ground is? Yeah, I thought a lot about that, right? Because there's already, I mean, you could argue that everything we're doing, you know, advertising, uh, like the whole industry is about manipulating, I mean, persuading, right? Where, where, yeah. where do you draw the line between persuading and informing and then manipulating? And for me, it has to align with the user's interests. I'm all for, pers- you know, I'm all for a platform that personalizes content based on my interests because that's a better use of my time if you just recommend mm-hmm. content that I will love. So I'm all for that. Um, but it's, it is, yeah, it is a fine line between doing that and then in, in, in encroaching on, on my privacy and, and, um, yeah, so, so it definitely well, so the thing about content that you love. And I, as a media creator, I've thought a lot about this and I, I've brought this up on the show before, um, particularly when you go to a place like YouTube or whatever it is. And I, I remember, you know, so like for a while, particularly right after Trump got elected, I was watching Seth Meyers and next thing I know, yeah. I started getting Stephen Colbert and Trevor Noah the other day, yeah. like. You know, and every now and then, just for curiosity, I will actually go and watch something on Fox News. And my roommate was like, well, don't be surprised if you have a bunch of recommendations from Fox now. But I, I guess, you know, the upside, like you said, of having personalized content is 
that it's personalized, we don't waste time. The downside is the divisiveness that we get from, you know, creating multiple versions of the truth, particularly when it comes to things like news and media. Uh, how do you, like, do you think that we can resolve that? Yeah, again, that's kind of very interesting too, because we end up in these like echo chambers, right? We're just hearing, um, we're just, yeah, we're just like hearing more of the same, right? And and not, mm-hmm. and, and kind of stuck in our own bubbles. Um, I I, th- I think that's technology agnostic. I mean, I don't know how our technology could make it better or worse, to be honest. It's about mm-hmm. how you package this all up in an experience that allows allows for explore like in, in the business world we talk about exploration and exploitation right um mm-hmm. exploitation you're kind of doing more of the same you, you 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 know how to do it and you're just like doing more of it whereas the exploration allows you to step outside of your comfort zone and experience the new and i i think we all need a combination of both um hmm yeah yeah, yeah and i think that concept needs to be built in more yeah. across our, all of our digital experiences yeah, I mean, do you think that we've gone, you know, when you think about like Facebook, Twitter, you know, sort of the platforms we've built, do you think that we've gone so far that we've created damage that's going to be irreversible at this point? Uh, um, I don't know that it's irreversible. I, I mean, you, you look at, I, I think it's a tough question because I'm, I'm on all these platforms and I, I have contemplated, I mean, I've contemplated leaving Facebook many, many times. But but at the same time, it gives me yeah. a unique um, way to interact with people I wouldn't otherwise interact with. So in a way, like I, I talk about this in the book, like I'm grateful to all these platforms because it has allowed kind of, uh, it has allowed us to connect with people we wouldn't have otherwise been able to connect with. Um, but it but But on the downside, it creates an illusion of a real connection. And often it's not. Yeah. Um, and and I think yeah. we're going to see a lot of innovation, honestly, with with social media platforms and how people like. I think we're especially with this pandemic and now that we're all on Zoom all the time and connecting virtually, we're going to see a, a whole new line of innovation around how do you create real shared experiences digitally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I realized there was one thing I forgot to ask you about that took place earlier in the book, um, and that was your. Uh, experience of pitching VCs on a Sand Hill Road while uh-huh. wearing a hijab. And I wondered about that because I, like, I wonder what misperceptions did you have to overcome? Like in that situation, like what challenges did you have to deal with? Yeah, I think this whole pro- process was just, um, so it was, it was Roz and I, so two, uh, MIT scientists. Um, and as I, as you just said, I was, I, I wore the hijab at the time. Uh, so very clearly Muslim and uh, it was our first company and we were pitching an emotion company to a very predominantly ma- older white male community. And, and in fact, I say predominantly, but it was exclusively older white males, right? Um, so I imagine, I kind of like to put myself in other people's shoes. Um, I imagine we just looked so different than anything they had ever seen before, or they were used to seeing that it was just like really outside of their comfort zone. Um, and I remember all of the meetings because of probably because of our MIT connection, we were able to schedule the meetings and, 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 and we had real amazing demos of the technology. So everybody was, was always fascinated and intrigued, but not enough, not enough to invest. Right. So, so we had to, I mean, we ended up, I mean, we've raised over $50 million of venture and strategic funding. So, um, you know, with enough persistence, you get there, but it definitely was not easy. And I, and I, I, I now have become a huge advocate for diversity and inclusion in tech and getting more funding towards female founders and more funding towards female funders. Cause we need more diversity in the investment community as well. Yeah, you know, it, it's, um, like looking at this story and I remember reading this thinking, wow, you're like a unicorn of a human being. I mean, you've accomplished things that most people probably couldn't fathom, like, you know, being an immigrant, coming to another country, building this amazing startup, having worked at arguably the most prestigious technical school in the world. What I wonder is how your definition of of success, money and wealth has changed with age and time and throughout this experience. 
Uh, first, uh, I, I have to say, like, I hear you say this and there's a voice in my head thinking like, really? No, like <laughs> I have so much inner doubt. It's not even funny. So <laughs> um, I, 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 I don't quite see it that way. I, I really do think I'm, I'm a work in progress and the verdict is out on, uh, you know, on <laughs> really. But, um, but I have, I, 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 again, I grew up in the Middle East where a lot of women are not financially independent. And so I've had to, being a divorced woman and being a single mom in, in the US, I've, re I've really had to learn how to become financially independent. So step one was to, you know, I, I, I bought a house. Um, I started saving up, which sounds insane, but literally I, 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 I only started saving in my 30s because um, I, I didn't really know any better. Um, and, and, and now for me, wealth is about, um, being able to s spend money on causes that I really care about. And for me, that would be diversity and inclusion, especially, um, you know, obviously gender diversity, but also, um, you know, encouraging and inspiring young, young leaders, the next generation of AI leaders and innovators, um, which is something that I, that's, that, that, I wrote the book because I really wanted to inspire people out there to forge their own paths. And I'm, I'm finding that the book is creating all sorts of new friendships and new connections. So I, I hope to take that to the next level. Wow. Um, I feel like I could sit here and talk to you all day because this is just such a deep rabbit hole that's filled with all sorts of fascinating stuff. Uh, but I have one final question for you, which is how we finish all of our interviews at the Unmistakable Creative. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Um, for for me, it's it's empathy. I'm I'm gonna go with empathy because um, empathy brings us together and it creates this magical human connection. And I I hope with this pandemic which is when we're recording this, uh, we're all going through this at the same time, of course, experiencing it in different ways, but I, 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 I hope it's an opportunity to reclaim empathy in our world. I think that's the first time anybody has ever given me that answer. Uh, well, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us and sharing your story and your insights and your wisdom with our listeners. Uh, this has just been fascinating and intriguing. Where can people find out more about you, uh, the book, your work, and everything else that you're up to? So you can buy the book on any of your uh, favorite uh, book retailers. I also narrated the book myself. Uh, and it's pretty, like there are parts where I get quite emotional. Um, so if you're into audiobooks, um, please consider listening to it. Um, and if you do read the book or listen to it, please share how it resonated with you. Cause that's like the best part of all. Um, and I'm, I'm, you can find me on all social media platforms. I'm pretty easy to track down. And I do try awesome. to respond to every single message I get. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable and for everybody Creative listening, Podcast. We will wrap While the you're show listening, were there any that. moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared.